Good morning and welcome to Tain and Fern Free Church. Next Lord's Day we do hope to have the church building reopened. So if you've indicated to your elder that you do desire to come along to these physical services, then they'll be in touch this week as to whether you should come along this first one on the 20th of September or whether you will come on the second week of services. So your elder will be in touch. If uh, you would like to come along for the very first time uh, to church or to the services, then there will be spaces available uh, to come in under the regulations that we have been given. Uh, but feel free to get in touch with myself or Alistair uh, and we could allocate you a seat uh, beforehand. Our, our contact details are on the screen, but you are most welcome. Let us worship God. Let's sing together in Psalm 107. Psalm 107 in the Sing Psalms and from verse 10, the tune is Morven. Some sat in darkness and in gloom, in chains of iron held. They scorned the ways of God most high against his words, rebelled. Let's sing to God's praise. Pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this Sabbath morning again, and we want to uh, give you all the praise and all of the glory. Lord, we thank you for these words we have just been singing, and uh, we read in these in that first couple of stanzas about uh, the negative, the darkness the gloom, the chains of iron, they were scorned, they rebelled, the, the hard labour, the bitterness, the shame, they stumbled, they couldn't rise, they had nobody to help them. And so what did they do? Lord, we come to that climactic verse in verse 13, then to the Lord they cried for help. Oh, that many, even listening and watching today, would cry out to the Lord 
for help? And what was the answer to their cry to the Lord? The Lord saved them from their doom. Oh, gracious God, as we turn uh, to hear of how you saved Saul from his doom, from his darkness, and you brought him into the light of Jesus Christ, oh, that that would be true of, of many watching here today, that they would have their own story to tell of being part of your great story. Lord, we uh, pray that you would continue with our country, that you would be with our uh, governments, uh, both in uh, Westminster and in Holyrood. Lord, we pray that you would continue to lead them and guide them and give them wisdom, your wisdom. Uh, help us as a nation. As Lord, we uh, seem to be going a little bit uh, backwards in regards to uh, coming out away from this pandemic. But Lord, we just pray. We know that you are sovereign and we pray for a vaccine. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to be good citizens here in our nation and good citizens of Christ Jesus. Father, we are encouraged to pray for our brothers and sisters throughout our denomination. And today we join the church in praying for uh, Helmsdale, just a few miles up the road from us. We pray for uh, Roddy and for Marina, and we thank you for them uh, being part of our presbytery. We thank you for the encouragements that they have seen uh, in their time there in Helmsdale just in the last five years. Lord, may you continue to uh, help them as they seek to grow your church. Uh, may you help them to be in a stable position as a congregation and that Roddy would be able to continue ministering amongst your people there. Lord, we just hold them up to you and as a congregation we want to be praying for them this week. So lead us through your word, we ask. Open it to us. May the power of the Holy Spirit soften the hearts of the hearers that each and every one of us may know you better and perhaps today would know you truly for the first time. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to uh, speak with the young ones just uh, for a moment to now. You know, the grown-ups often uh, will talk to you and they'll say that perhaps you're too young or you're too old now, or you're too bad. I only say that because with Christmas just now a few months away, they may say if you're too bad, then you won't get any presents at Christmas. You need to be good. Well, it can be quite frustrating also when you learn that you're too young for something or too small. I often remember uh, going on family holidays to theme parks and my two older brothers would be able to go on these certain rides but me being younger and smaller I was unable to join them. I was too young or too small. Well it gets worse when you get older because then you are too old or too big to go on some of these rides or to go to the soft play you're not allowed because you're too old or too big. How old do you need to be to drive a car? You need to be 17. How old do you need to be to get married? At least 16. How old do you need to be to be on Facebook? You need to be 13. But how old do you need to be to become a Christian? There's no age limit. You see, I became a Christian. The Lord opened my eyes before I was able to drive. I became a Christian before I was allowed to get married. I became a Christian even before I was allowed to be on Facebook. There is no age limit. You're never too young and you're never too old. We're just about to read in the Bible and we're going to read about a man called Saul. Many people would have thought Saul was 
not too young or too old, but too bad to become a Christian. Lots of people were scared of, of Saul. They thought he was too bad to become a Christian. But Jesus didn't think that. And Jesus saved him. Jesus calls all of us to come to him. Whoever you are, however young you are, however old you are, he calls you to come to him. He wants us to trust in him and believe in him and to love him. So that is the question to you today. Will you put all your life and all your trust and all your love into Jesus Christ? Well, let's pray. Uh, together we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, let's read uh, God's Word in the New Testament as we continue our morning series of This Is My Story. And we're looking at Saul today. In Acts chapter 9, we're going to read from verse 1 to verse 19. Let's hear God's Word. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. The men travelling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground but when he opened his eyes he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man named from, and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. The Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptised and after taking some food he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. 
Amen. This is the word of God. Can you be saved? Can you become a Christian? Last week I was uh, back in my home village and when I went for a run my mind began to wander off in different directions. As I saw certain buildings and people and views it triggered different memories. I ran past this certain house that I had been in a very long time ago and this predominant memory flashed into my mind this statement. All I could hear was the lady of the house saying she is too young to become a Christian. The lady of that house was uh, talking about my big cousin who was 12 years old at the time. She had just been converted. She was now going along to the Wednesday prayer meeting and she now desired to become a member of the church. The lady, not a Christian then nor today, was adamant that my cousin was too young. Well, my cousin has now been a Christian for almost 20 years. The world may say that you are too young or too old or too good or too bad to become a Christian. There are plenty of people that we would rule out from being saved because we think that they have no interest whatsoever in Christianity. In fact, we think that they hate God. They're actually really just enemies of the church that we're a part of here. Could these people really be saved? Well, today we are reading the story Saul has to tell. He was a chief enemy of Christ a great threat to the advancement of the gospel. If anyone was to be ruled out for being too bad, it was this guy. But could Saul be saved? At the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus talks about a broad road that leads to destruction and a narrow road that leads to life. We could say that here Saul sets out on this journey to Damascus. He begins on the broad road. But by the time he reaches his destination, he is on the narrow road. So that's our two points this morning. The broad road and the narrow road. Well, we begin then with the broad road. What we know of Saul's past is that he was a Jew. He was a Roman citizen. He was a Pharisee. What's a Pharisee? A Pharisee is somebody who believes in God, but not in Jesus. They would attack Christ's people, but defend religion and the law with their own lives. Listen to Jesus talking about Pharisees in Matthew 23:15 Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees you hypocrites you travel over land and sea to win a single convert and when you have succeeded you make them twice as much the child of hell as you are He speaks very strongly about the Pharisees You know we know from Acts chapter 7 and 8 that Saul was complicit in the murder of Stephen. He's like a raging bull, destroying churches, invading homes and imprisoning believers, all in the name of religion. He was a man to be feared because it seemed that he was a man that couldn't be stopped, couldn't be changed, couldn't be saved. You know, we all have a past. Even you do. There are events and actions which you're not proud of. Situations that perhaps Satan replays in your minds over and over. 
Do these sins disqualify you from becoming a Christian? Can that blot on your record ever be removed? What can wash away your sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now Saul sets out on this broad road to Damascus. We notice then in verse 1 and 2, you can have a look at it, that he is angry, that he asks a question and that he takes action. We see how angry he is. He's burning with anger. He's snorting like that bull waiting to attack. You know, he wasn't just uninterested about Christianity like so many of the people that we meet in our own families and friend circles and in our workplaces. They just don't care about Christianity. But not not Saul. He hated Christians and the Christ that they worshipped or so-called Christ. He wanted to hurt them and to harm them. He wanted to kill them. Sometimes people can be all talk, saying they're going to do this or they're going to do that, but they never actually do it. Not Saul. Saul follows through with his evil plan. He goes to the high priest and he asks for this permission to imprison all the Damascus believers. Even though it was a 140 mile journey, you know, the distance and the travel wasn't going to stop Saul from being the best Pharisee there ever was. And it was no secret about his intentions were very public. Everybody knew it. We know that from Ananias who we'll meet in just a moment. He was scared of going anywhere near this man. Everyone knew Saul of Tarsus. His reputation went before him. So he takes action. And he sets out on the broad road to Damascus. You know, every single one of us have started out on that broad road. It's a road filled with many people, all travelling in the same direction. And at that point with the same story. C.S. Lewis writes, the same long terrible story of man trying to find something other than God to make him happy. And you know they never find it unless they find God. Jesus says at the end of his great sermon that that broad road leads to destruction. What I pray is that before your journey ends that you will be on the narrow road that leads to life. So we see the broad road, but we come secondly and in detail to the narrow road. Saul began that day on the broad road to Damascus, but he ends it on the narrow road. In the blinker of an eye, it all changed. We see that in the middle of verse 3. Suddenly, a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and he heard a voice. I want you to notice something very important here. That Saul did nothing to merit his becoming a Christian. He wasn't so good or so honourable or so respected in the community that he deserved to become a follower of Christ. Quite the opposite. He's later going to declare himself in his own letters to be the chief of sinners. In Philippians chapter 3, he lists all the qualifications he has for being a great religious man. I did this and this and this and this. And what does he conclude? It was all rubbish. He actually says it's like dung from an animal. You see, this is God's work, the conversion, the transformation, the saving of souls. We've entitled this uh, morning series that we're doing, This is My Story. But it's only Saul's story 
or Lazarus' story or Mary's story because God has brought them into his story. The story of his one and only son, Jesus Christ, who has come into this world, who has died on the cross for our sin, who has risen from the grave and ascended back to glory so that sinners like me and you can have a story to tell, saying that I once was lost, but now Jesus has found me. If the Lord is going to save your life, then it will be the Lord who doesn't. Not your ministers, not your church attendants, not your good deeds in the community. It will be the Lord. And this is why you hear us praying so often. In fact, every service we are praying it. That the power of the Holy Spirit would come and open your eyes. Because it's nothing that we do or can do, but it is the Lord who doesn't. But there is no distinction with grace. Many of you never thought you would become a Christian, yet here you are. And so you can say, but for the grace of God. And may you, Christian, remind yourself of that today. Saul set out that day to imprison anyone who was part of this Christian movement but he ended the day part of it himself. John 3, 8. The wind blows where it pleases. You hear its sound. You cannot tell where it's come from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. We'll have a look at verse 3 as we see this uh, transformation in Saul's life. A, a light flashed around him. It was a light from heaven. Make no mistake about that. This wasn't just the cat triggering the sensor light outside. This was from the Lord. Later in verse 27 and in his letters, Saul makes clear that he actually saw the risen Christ. The Christ Saul lived to disprove now proves himself in Saul's life. So overwhelmed, Saul falls to the ground and after hearing this voice and he hears the voice calling his name, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul had asked the high priest for permission to persecute the Christians and now the Christ was asking Saul, why do you persecute me? See, this is a great encouragement for the Christian because here Jesus identifies himself with his church. If you persecute Christians, you are persecuting Christ. If you are an enemy of the church, you are an enemy of Jesus. Saul's life is here turned upside down. Jesus of Nazareth is, he concludes, risen from the dead. The story that all these Christians had told as he dragged them out of their homes and imprisoned them. As they told all of these stories and the story that Stephen was telling as the stones hurled towards him and brought him to his death. The story that they told, Saul now realises was all true. He realises that his life, though lived in zeal for the one true God, has in reality been one of ignorance and unbelief. And let me just stop there for a moment because I wonder, I do wonder if some of you who have perhaps obediently come and you have perhaps even said that you believe in God, you believe this one true God and yet you live your life in ignorance and unbelief because you have not given your life over to Jesus Christ 
Jesus of Nazareth who has risen from the dead. Through the persecuting of the church, Saul realises that he has been an enemy to God. He is in this moment convicted of his sin and what a sinner he is. Surely, surely he's too much of a sinner. Surely he's too bad to become a Christian. Surely our God would not have mercy on such an evil man. Surely there is no place in the kingdom for somebody who has imprisoned and murdered many faithful men and women of God. Oh, do you remember Stephen's prayer at the end of Acts 7 before he was murdered? He says in verse 59, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. You see, Stephen is echoing the prayer of his saviour Jesus on the cross. Remember, we were looking at the sayings of Jesus on the cross. And I think uh, the second saying of Jesus, Father, Forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. The Lord heard Stephen's prayer. And at least one of these murderous men were saved and were forgiven all their sin. This is the God we worship. Not a God who turns a blind eye to sin, but a God who deals with with sin to save the sinners. As Saul responds in obedience to the Lord's request, he discovers that he is blind. The physical effects, they will last for three days, but the spiritual effects, they will last his lifetime. And in these three days of darkness, Saul has the opportunity to meditate on he who is the light of the world. He can ponder on this promised salvation available only through the last person that his eyes have gazed upon, the risen Lord Jesus. Jesus who must have become more and more clear and precious to him. During these three days, a man named Ananias is given his own vision from the Lord. He's initially filled with fear, but eventually he responds in faith. But have a look at verse 17. I find this word so incredible. Ananias was so fearful of this man. He questions whether uh, the Lord should be sending him to him because Saul has permission to imprison anybody who is a Christian. But what's the first word Ananias says to Saul? He calls him brothers. You see, there's no interrogation. There is identification. Identification that this man is a brother in Christ. There is identification that he is just like me, Ananias, one who has been saved by grace, the grace of God, one who has been justified by faith alone. Brother Saul. And immediately in verse 18, something like scales fell from his eyes. He once was blind, but now he sees his physical blindness linked to his spiritual blindness, but now his physical sight linked to his spiritual sight. Saul's response is commitment. He's baptised, he's publicly declaring his faith in Jesus as Messiah. You know, we won't all have Damascus Road experiences. But every Christian has a dramatic story to tell. Saul has a dramatic story to tell. Not because he was an enemy of God or because light flashed from heaven all around him or because a voice came to him from heaven or because he saw the risen Lord Jesus or because he was blind for three days. Saul has a dramatic story to tell 
because he once was lost and now he's found because he once was in the darkness and now he is in the light of Jesus Christ. He once was a sinner but now he is a sinner who has been saved. He is a saint. He started on the broad road that leads to destruction but he finished his journey on the narrow road that leads to eternal life. This is Saul's story. This is my story. This can be your story. We will not all have Damascus Road experiences and in that sense it doesn't matter. What matters this morning is your answer to this question. Are you on the broad road that is leading to hell or are you on the narrow road that leads to glory? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that you are a God of grace, a God of mercy, a God of love, a God who doesn't just turn a blind eye to sin, but a God who deals with sin to save the sinners. O oh Lord, that there would be miracles happening throughout Tain and Fern, throughout the Highlands, throughout Scotland, and far beyond the Sabbath day as souls are taken from darkness to light. We ask it in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, let us uh, conclude by singing together in Psalm 18, in the Sing Psalms. Psalm 18 from verse 21, the tune is Duke Street. For I have kept the ways of God, from him I have not turned away. I have not strayed from his decrees, his statutes ever with me stay. Let us sing to God's praise. grace, mercy and peace from God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of you both now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>